Well, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Happy Sabbath to everyone. And uh, we are today not looking in Revelation as we've been studying, but we are going to uh, look at the topic of uh, until we meet again. So we'll come back to Revelation on the subsequent week. We'll pick up in Revelation chapter 7 where the end of chapter 6 was, and the question was, well, the great day of his wrath has come, and who is going to stand? So we'll answer that question when we meet next time when we look in chapter 7. Today we're looking at the topic again of until we meet again. In the sixth chapter of the book of John, verses 53 through verse 57, we read the words, in the experience of Jesus. Uh, he declared this, and the, the truth that he gave became very confrontational or controversial to those that listened. They listened to what he said, but they heard it not with an, a spiritual ear, but they heard it with literal ears and literal intent. They didn't take his words in a spiritual meaning. They took his words in a literal meaning. And because he said something, it, it, it offended them. It was vile speech to them unconscionable, unimaginable that, that Jesus was talking almost as a cannibal or, and that they, the hearers, would be, respond in this cannibalistic way. It says in verse 53 that Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you that except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and you drink his blood, then you have no life in you. And that repulsed the hearers. Because he said that you have to eat his flesh and drink his blood. And every word that was given, they took it in a literal understanding, a literal mindset. That was their, their view. They, whatever was presented to them, they were going to take it literally. So here they're hearing Jesus say that you must eat his flesh and drink his blood. He goes even further. He went further to say that if you don't do this and you don't have life in you. So if you're not eating me. If you're not drinking my blood, you don't have life in you. Now, this, again, does not fly in the face of their understanding of what he is saying, because what he's talking about is certainly it breaks all the, the laws regarding kosher and dietary eating. Not only does it break those laws in terms of what is kosher, but it is also breaking the commands of God to kill someone and to consume and eat the flesh. But this is what he was saying according to their knowledge and their understanding. Uh, in verse 54, he says, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinks my blood, then that person has eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day, for my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. And he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwells in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me even he shall live by me. Eat my flesh and drink my blood, and you have eternal life. And if you eat my flesh and drink of my blood, uh, then my life dwells in you, even the life that I have received of the Father. And, and as they heard this, this became a challenge to them. Because what is this man talking about? What is he suggesting? Well, very simply, Jesus was not meaning or talking about literally eating his flesh and drinking or consuming his blood. We, we know that he was giving a spiritual lesson that he was uh, seeking to convey. And the lesson was that he wanted them to, to take his teachings, take his life. Let that be a part of our life. If we would live off of his life, receive his life. And the only way that we'll be able to receive his life is by consuming it, not literally consuming it, by let, taking it on the characteristics of his life, taking upon us uh, his nature, his 
goodness. And if we would do so, then we would be able to have eternal life. And so his teachings, his doctrine, all those things that he shared, that that would be vital and that would be important to being able to eat, eat his flesh and to drink his blood. This is what life consists of. The very nature of being able to live is that it subsists off of everyday eating and gaining enough nutrients to survive. Well, in the spiritual world, he is saying then that to, to survive spiritually, then you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And if you do this, then you have eternal life that's abiding in you. That lesson he taught to the disciples, and we uh, fast forward certainly into the experience that he had in what we call the Last Supper. Now, it's not called the Last Supper uh, in Jesus' day. But it was referred to as the feast. And the feast that he was about to embark on, it, it is a lot different from how we customarily and traditionally celebrate communion. In fact, as he gathered in, as you see the picture depicting what the Last Supper was like, it actually is wrong on a number of different fronts. We typically see it as people sitting up in our upright chairs that we are accustomed to, but the reality is, is that they were not sitting in upright chairs in Jesus' time. Further, the meal that is served, of course, in the picture is not accurate, nor is the, uh, the, the, the leaning taking place is what one would expect. They would eat and they would lean uh, in a reclining method and, and their feet would be on a couch. A lot different than what the picture is, but the picture is just a picture. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we find the meaning behind it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and in verse 23, the Bible says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I have delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he, he was betrayed, he took bread, and, he, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Now again, I want to tie that back to what we read in John chapter 6. So this is a new part that's taking place in the, the service. But he now wants them to eat some bread. And he says, this bread is a symbol of my body which is broken for you. Further says, and after the same manner that he also took the cup and when he had supped or, drank, or drunk from it, he, he said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood or the new covenant or a new agreement in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. So you eat the bread and you drink the blood uh, or the wine. It's a symbol of my life, my death, my resurrection. In Exodus chapter 12 and verse 11, we read of the ancient celebration of the Passover. We give the term in the New Testament of the Lord's Supper, and as we gather, we say that we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper. But in Jesus' day, it was not called the Lord's Supper, it was called Passover. And they were celebrating and assembling for Passover. And, and read with me in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 11 of one of the facets of Passover. It says, And thus shall ye eat it, your loins girt, your shoes on, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. How are they to eat? the lamb. It says they would have their loins girt, they would have their shoes on, their staff was in their hands, and they would eat it in haste. I can uh, relate to the last portion. I, I eat all my food hastily. Sometimes when we're sitting down, people say, you, you're done? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm done. But this was everyone. They had to eat it in haste. And, and this is sort of counterintuitive to what we normally would think. You want to sit down and be able to eat and enjoy your meal and not rush. And we talk about uh, eat slowly. Uh, you know, don't inhale your food. Chew it slowly. Digest it. Be able to enjoy it. But they're told on this particular occasion that this is how they are to eat. So picture all the children of Israel. Over a million, some estimates of maybe one and a half million that are in the land of Goshen. And they are gathered inside their houses and they're eating the Passover. They have the 
uh, the braised lamb before them, and they are sharing it. The blood has been put on the doorposts and so forth. Uh, the leaven has been taken out of the home, and the, the prayers have been offered. And as they're eating it, they're, they're eating with their shoes on their feet. What time of day is this taking place? Well, this is late in the evening that they are eating um, this meal. So after a hard day's work, you'd, when you sit at your table, you would typically, I imagine, take your shoes off. And you want to relax a little bit because you've worked a long day and you want to be able to relax, catch up with one another, and eat your food, and have a good conversation and so forth. And, and this is not forbidden, but in this instance, they're told to, to stand, keep your shoes on, have your stick in hand, and to eat it quickly. The excitement that must have taken place in Goshen as they are hearing the shrieks uh, and the horror that is coming from the Egyptians that are um, just a few miles away and even maybe up close to the border of the slaying of the firstborn. And the anticipation and the excitement that they have of being able to go. And during this, we read in Patriots and Prophets, they're eating it in silence during this time. And, there, and I would imagine a, a solemnity, but also a joy over what's about to happen. We are, are actually about to leave this place because Moses has told them, and so this is why they have to eat it in haste, because in a moment's notice, they're going to have to go. This is why they have their loins on, uh, girt, because they're going to have to leave. They don't have time to sit and to gather their shoes and get them all tied. It's like, it's time to go. When I say it's time to go, we need to go. So there's this excitement and the anticipation of what is to take place and, and what will happen there. And so they are gathering around to eat it. And so uh, the question that I look at is, well, how are they eating it? Well, we know that they're eating it in haste. And their spirit about them then is one of ambivalence and also joy. What is the next chapter going to look like for them as a people as they leave here and as they seek to go elsewhere? This service that they partook of, according to verse 14, God told them that this would be a memorial for them. That they would keep a feast to the Lord throughout all their generations and that they would keep it as an ordinance forever. What you are experiencing, I want you to keep it as a feast forever. In another translation, it says that this is a day to remember. Each year, from generation to generation, you must do what? Celebrate it as a special festival to the Lord. So I must make a confession to you that typically, and for the most part, when I've celebrated and thought of communion, I've thought of it more in the, uh, the contemplative and the reflective portion. And maybe perhaps you have as well. But as I read and was preparing and looked in Exodus and some other places, there, there is a, um, a foreshadowing of what it's talking about, meaning specifically. They were to celebrate it as a special festival to the Lord. So think about a festival. When you are celebrating, is it typically uh, downbeat or is it more uplifting? Is it, is it more uh, melancholy or... exhilarating and you'll probably say it's more exhilarating well you know having a festa you're in a couple of weeks you'll be celebrating Thanksgiving and whether there's going to be you know one thing on the table or a hundred things on the table oh we celebrate Thanksgiving already have we okay all right this week yeah I, I said before you know as you get older you start forgetting things you know you just it you just don't know. You, know, you don't, I don't even know what day it is. You just know, okay, it's, just make sure. You, you said that's how you feel all the time? Okay, you retire. Well, you definitely don't know what day it is. It's just, okay, so it's a miracle you showed up today in church, you know. But you can certainly relate, you just forget things. 
But we're going to celebrate Thanksgiving in a couple of days, in fact, on Thursday. And so in doing so, we'll come together. It's going to be a festive occasion in whatever house you find yourself in. It's going to be festive. People are going to be happy to be able to see each other. You're going to have different stories that you share, different things that you are thankful for, and you're going to enjoy a feast together. So in the context in of the Passover, not to make him one to one, but the instruction was that this is a memorial that I want you to keep a feast to me every year. And it's a festival that I want you to have forever. As they would see how God would work miraculously for them, they've seen all the plagues fall upon Egypt. And now this last plague has, has fallen down, the slaying of the firstborn. And God is about to do even bigger things in their behalf, but he wants them to be anchored. I want you to always remember this. So as you come back and you think upon this, this would not be a time of negative reflection, but a time of positive reflection. In other words, when they look back on this chapter and they were four years in the promised land and they sit down and they eat and they say, well, remember when we were in Egypt of how God worked this miracle for us, that was going to be a cause of celebration, right? If it's a year later, they're going to talk about when we were there, how God did this miracle for us, we celebrate this. If it was 40 years down the road or 500 years down the road as they continued on, he says, I want you to do it forever. So whenever they would come together, it would be a celebration, just recounting again the goodness of God, not only then, but his goodness that it continued thereafter. So make it a, a festive celebration and a festive occasion. Hence, by the time we come to the New Testament, things have changed. In the description in the book of Exodus, they had to eat it with their staff in hand. And they also had their shoes on. They had the lowens girt. They were standing as they were eating, and they had to eat it in haste because they were waiting for the, the summons to leave. But that situation has now totally changed and altered. Now they're living in the promised land. See, before they were going to the promised land, now they're in the promised land. Now they're not trying to escape the hostility of the Egyptians, but that has been broken. They're sitting in there enjoying. So in this time, the, the whole economy has changed. They're not eating in haste. They're sitting down and they're enjoying the fellowship together, just talking and having a good time. Of, again, the stories of his deliverance, of his preservation, and of the redemption that they have seen. They're not eating in haste. Their shoes are not on, but their shoes are off. We know that their shoes are off. Because according to the story in John, as well as the Matthew's account, that Jesus takes it upon himself to wash their feet. According to Desire of Ages and, and many historians, they said that this was a task uh, that when they would come inside and they would sit down for this, that there were servants that were accustomed, that would come by and they would wash the feet of the attendees. Again, way different from, from us. And, and I don't know about you, but uh, I'm not necessarily, I, I, I would probably feel a little off going to your home and somebody saying, well, I'm going to come wash your feet. Because it's not a part of our culture, but this was a part of, of their culture. This was something that was a custom. And the person who did it was a servant or either a slave. And so they would come forth and do that. And as they would sit down to eat, they're not sitting down in upright chairs, but the chairs were, uh, were couches. And so they would lean down or lay down on the left side, and then thus they would be able to eat with their right hand. Of course, that's making the supposition that they're right-handed. So when this was done in the days of Jesus, this was the setup, the, the room that he had chosen. Um, this was to be done, and it was to be a, um, a celebratory experience. Not only was it to be one of, of that, but what was it to symbolize? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, if you would turn back quickly, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, there's a new aspect that is introduced. Historically, they had the Paschal Lamb um, that was to be Sacrifice uh, and consume on the 14th day of Abib. And now, Jesus introduces a new component to the service. They had, of course, the bitter herbs and so forth that they ate that reminded them of their bondage. 
But now he's bringing in a few instructions that will be with them forever. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and verse, again, 22, he says, For I have received from the Lord that which I have also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And so this is a different piece that he introduces now. Um, the taking of the bread and the drinking of the wine. And this becomes commemorative of, of our service. Why did he choose um, these two things? Uh, this was to take the place of the Paschal feast that they had. So he has the bread and he also has the, uh, the wine. And we read in verse 24, And when he had given thanks, then he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. And so the bread is broken to symbolize Christ's body being broken for his disciples, for his church. And then he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Another word for new covenant or the testament is an agreement. What's happening in the, the supper is that Christ is ratifying an agreement with his disciples. See, the, the, there's a transition from the economy, from the, the paschal service that they have, because the lambs are no longer going to be sacrificed going forward. He wants his disciples to be able to have something to be able to call to mind. But keep in mind, the... Passover that they were sacrificing, um, that was looking forward. What was it looking forward to? It was looking forward to Calvary. The only way that they were, had survived was because of Calvary. That's why the blood was put upon the, the, the lintels and upon the doorposts. That all of that by faith looked forward to one day that the lamb would come and the lamb would lay down his life so that the angel of death would be able to pass over us and the only way we could be able to be passed over is that the blood covers our lives. Now, he is about to die, and so there no longer be the animal sacrifices to be brought. Now, he could have easily said, I'm, I am dying, and I want you to still bring the animal sacrifice because there's a lot of significance there. But he is the, the total sacrifice. He is the perfect sacrifice. There's no other sacrifice that could bring a lesson anywhere near as the offering of Jesus. So he voluntarily gives his life. And, and to his disciples, he's saying, you won't celebrate this anymore. But the, the point that you, I want you to recall is from Exodus chapter 12, they were to do this throughout their generations. They were to do it forever as a memorial unto them. Incidentally, they were to do this sacrifice how often? Once a year. When were they to do it? On the appointed day, the 14th of Nisan. They were to do the sacrifice. Jesus changes the whole economy. You don't need to bring a lamb and to have a sacrifice, and to have blood. I'm giving my life. As you eat the bread, this is a symbol of my life that is broken for you. As you drink the wine, and the wine then that he offers them is a symbol of his blood. Back to Matthew chapter 26, he talks about the, the, the reality that he's going to wait to celebrate this. So in verse 25, he says again that this is the new covenant that is in my blood. This do as, as, ye, as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Or he is telling them that you are not restricted to celebrate this service once a year. The Passover was once a year. This service, he says, you can do it as much as you desire. The Passover is looking forward to the reality that the Messiah will come and die. The Lord's Supper is not looking to Calvary. Calvary is going to be a thing in the past. Calvary makes it possible that we're able to enjoy the Lord's Supper. But what the communion service in is looking forward to is the promise of the covenant that he has given. Because he's saying this is the cup of the new covenant. I'm ratifying it. And the covenants, of course, were ratified by the offering of blood. 
And so the blood is going to ratify the covenant that is being made. And what is he covenanting with them? Well, he's given them the promise and the covenant in John chapter 14. He says, In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, then I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, then I will come again and receive you into myself. The covenant that he has given with Israel is that I'm going to write my law upon the table of your hearts and upon your statues. I'm going to take out the old heart. I'm going to give you a, a new heart. I'm going to take away that uh, heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I'm going to give you from that old spirit. I'm going to give you a new spirit. In verse 26, he says, and for often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So as often as we assemble, and celebrate Passover in the sense of the Lord's Supper. We are testifying and showing forth the Lord's death till he comes. Well, we are remembering his death, but we are also reflecting upon what somber reality, what, what joyfulness. The joyfulness then is in verse 26 that we show forth the Lord's death until he comes. Until he comes. So the service is then to again be centered around the reality that he is to come and that he's coming back again for those whom he's making this covenant with. So he's saying to his disciples, celebrate as often as you want. Whenever your heart is overwhelmed and you want a, a reality, a reminder that I've made the covenant, that, Lord, I am with you always, even until the end of the world, celebrate again that my covenant is given and that I'm going to come and to receive you into myself. I shared before, um, that typically we or I have celebrated the part of the communion service more of a, uh, a somber reality. Because you think of the sins we've committed and our unworthiness and the need that we have of cleansing. You say, well, wait a minute. I thought that was necessary to be able to be done. Read on with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 27. He says, that, therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Whoever eats the bread and drinks the wine in an unworthy manner is guilty, he says, of the body and the blood of of the Lord. After reading that, you might say, well, I'm not going to take uh, communion then because I, I am unworthy. I am so unworthy to take communion. But please understand what he is suggesting by being unworthy. He's not saying that because you are a sinner and because I am a sinner, I am unworthy and that you are unworthy. He is not saying that because you are imperfect and because I am imperfect that you are unworthy. He is not saying because you have sinned that you are unworthy. He is saying in verse 28 that a man needs to examine himself. And so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Or we put it another way then, if we don't examine ourselves, then don't drink of the cup. Don't eat of the bread. Because in the process of examination, we should see deficiencies and defects of character. And because we see those deficiencies and defects of character, it should lead us to the fountain that is filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. It will allow us then to be cleansed, to be washed, to be given, to be made right with him, to have our wrongs uh, made right. So then that we might be able to eat of this covenant that he has given to us, saying that I am ratifying this covenant with you. Notice as it goes on to say in verse 29, that whoever eats and drinks in, in an unworthy manner, he eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. In Desire of Ages, we read uh, this in page 659. But the communion service was not to be a season of sorrowing. This was not its purpose. As the Lord's disciples gather about his table, they are not to remember and lament their shortcomings. They are not to dwell upon their past religious experience 
whether that experience has been elevating or depressing. They are not to recall the differences between them and their brethren. So to frame where we are, we're talking about gathering around the table then and being able to partake of the, the, the wine and the bread. And the reminder then is that it's not now to be a season of sorrow. And that's where I started in the beginning. Um, as they gathered around, this was going to be an opportunity of, of thanksgiving, of festiveness, of joy, of anticipation of, of what God is doing in their behalf and what he would do uh, for them. But we oftentimes, when we gather around, uh, we, we are more, uh, again, contemplative um, and sorrowing. And then there's a hope then that, all right, we're now we've made it, it, it at one with God. But maybe we've missed the mark. This was not its purpose. As the Lord's disciples gather about his table, they are not to remember and lament their shortcomings. They are not to dwell upon their past religious experience, whether that experience has been elevating or depressing. They are not to recall the differences between them and their brethren. The preparatory service has embraced all this. The preparatory service has embraced all this. The self-examination, the confession of sin, the reconciling of differences, all has been done. Now they come to meet Christ. They are not to stand in the shadow of the cross, but in its saving light. So this is why Jesus didn't say keep offering lambs. Because we're on the other side of Calvary. And the grace and the light that streams from Calvary, that end is what we're to stand in. The shadow of the cross, when you think of those, the, that, that imagery or that metaphor, the language that is there, the shadow of the cross. Um, we talk about the cross and the shadow. The shadow is just, it kind of crosses. Those are the things that it's pointing forward to. But when the substance comes, the body comes. Now the shadow was done away with. So now we celebrate then, and we are thankful we are dwelling in the, the presence of Christ. And we are looking forward not to his crucifixion, but he said to do it often as you think about my coming. The crucifixion would certainly be a moment of sorrow, but the coming of the Son of Man would be a day of joy. The crucifixion would certainly cause ones to heart uh, to weep over what has taken place, but the reality of the coming of the Son of Man is what inspires and what causes your heart to beat and to thrill with joy. So we don't look back to what has taken place on Calvary, but we're looking forward to that which is going to take place in the future. So then the communion service then is transporting our minds from earth to the grandeur and to the appeal of the majesty in heaven. It says, they are to open the soul to the bright beams of the Son of Righteousness with hearts cleansed by Christ's most precious blood and full consciousness of, of his presence. Although unseen, they are to hear his words, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, and not as the world giveth, give I unto you. In Matthew 26 and verse 29, Jesus fittingly then said these words in conclusion. He says, are said, but I say unto you that I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of this vine until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. You can keep taking part of this service and you do it in remembrance as you, as you partake of it, as you eat the bread of my broken body, as you drink of the blood, remembering the covenant that I've made with you of the promise that I'm going to come back and I'm going to take you from this earth. I'm going to receive you into myself. And there in my father's house, in the father's kingdom, that we're going to one day sit down and I will serve you myself. You will drink of this new wine in the kingdom. And so our minds then uh, transcend from a state on earth and they are transported to a state above. Because this covenant has been given and the word tells us that his covenant he will not alter 
Uh, nor will he break the thing that has gone forth out of his lips. And so he's um, ratifying it with his disciples. And a part of that ratification, in summary, was he said that um, not one of my disciples has been lost, save the son of perdition. That based off of his choice, his action, his response. Uh, for us, as we celebrate and look at the, uh, the Lord's Supper, uh, then it is a forward uh, thinking experience. What will it be like then to sit down at the table that will stretch for miles, uh, that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the redeemed of all ages will be there? A table made of silver, and we see the gatherings of the redeemed from all ages, and Christ himself girding himself and, and serving because we have been redeemed by the blood of the lamb and we celebrate and we remember and we contemplate and we look forward and it causes then um, joy for the things and the blessings that he has done, but even greater so those things that he will do for us in the very near future, not on this earth, but the reality of it was, was the promise in of the fulfillment of his coming and the establishment of his eternal kingdom. And so God, God almighty, we pray that you would establish uh, in our hearts and lives this day. Pray that you would help us to take advantage of the opportunity, of, again, of being able to renew this covenant with you. You've given it to us. It has been ratified by your blood. And so you intend to, to keep it uh, to us. And the covenant that you've promised is not only for cleansing and for washing, but of one day being able to walk with you on streets that are made of gold. It seems like it may be an impossibility as we look into our own uh, thoughts. But we look not upon our failures. We look not upon our elevation. But we simply remember and think about you and the promise that you've given of your soon coming. And so I pray then, Lord, that as we prepare to go into this supper, uh, that we might do so with a heart that is full of joy, a heart that is uplifted, and a heart that is uh, celebrating all that you have done for us and that you will do. For we ask this prayer in Jesus' name, amen.